You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Welcome to PAS 892, Exemplary Practices in Catholic Teaching and Learning. Today, we have a special treat for you. We have a debt psychologist, Dr. Angela Arden. Uh, but before we go to Dr. Arden, uh, let's uh, ask uh, Dr. Joan Gilbert to lead us in prayer. Uh, Dr. Gilbert. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that through the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for pray us. For us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you. you so, so very much, Dr. Gilbert. Well, let me introduce uh, Dr. Angela Arden. Um, uh, this, is, um, this is a pleasure for me, uh, because uh, uh, Dr. Arden has um, an impressive uh, pedigree, and I'll begin. Uh, Dr. Angela Arden has a doctorate in cognitive psychology from the University of New Hampshire and has done postdoctoral work in depth psychology, literature, and phenomenology. She has written books and articles on the interface of, of these areas. And her uh, next book uh, will hopefully be produced by Onward Books and Media. Her teaching experience includes the University of Dallas, which was formative in her interdisciplinary and great books approach to education. She also had a debt psychology practice for 25 years, 25 plus years, and has been professor of humanities at Holy Apostles College and Seminary since 2006. She teaches courses in literature and psychology to undergraduates and human formation to seminarians. With that, uh, Dr. Arden, we are uh, delighted and uh, edified by your presence here with us today. Uh, please, uh, it's all yours. Thank you for the prayer, Joan, and thank you, Sebastian, for the introduction. Well, as many of you know, I've been a professor at Holy Apostles for some time. And if any of you are interested in my background or how I got here, you can hear my recent interview on WCAT with Mary Ann Orlakis. And because I've been at this primarily Thomas school for about 15 years now, I've been hesitant to share my work since it comes from another perspective resting on other philosophical assumptions than the Thomas, and different from the one of which many of you are familiar. And for anyone who doesn't understand what I've just said, it's larger than, but somewhat like, going into a Ford auto place and praising the virtues of Chevy's. Or for the, for the younger, anyone younger here, going into Samsung before 2019, and praising the virtues of Apple. Now, apparently, there's a partnership between the two, access on smart TV. But anyway, a partnership is what I'm attempting here today. As my spiritual director recently said, it's critical, particularly today, to share differences as well as similarities in education. And I do appreciate Sebastian's willingness to include other perspectives in this course. So I'm going to begin with definitions of depth psychology, of metoxy, and of forms, with examples from Plato's Symposium, Simone Weil's essay, and St. Augustine's conversion to discuss my work. I'll then finish with prominent Catholics whose statements have relevance for depth psychology. So let's begin. Depth psychology is my field, and it's an examination of a realm lying beneath or behind the surface consisting of patterns, figures, and landscapes affecting one, but of which one is unaware. The examination and slow assimilation of this realm results in a peace in one's existence, healthy satisfaction in areas of love and work. Now, because I teach on Mondays, I'm here today, which is not a required class time, as you know. So I, not being sure that many could attend, I made my presentation for about 40 minutes. I decided not to include a PowerPoint, though that's what I use in my teaching. 
because I understand that today I'll mainly be speaking to colleagues. And also this way I can speak directly to you. And much of what I'm saying is in my book, Orbits of Symphony. And I'll provide a bibliography at the end of my talk. As you could hear in my WCAT interview, my understanding of and work in this realm of depth psychology comes directly from my experience with others since I was three years old. And from my studies and interactions with mentors, writing books on it for about 40 years, as well as my depth psychological practice with patients for 25 plus years. And so I've seen how crucial depth psychology is for the healthy development and healing. My work finds an alliance between it and Christianity and does so from a Neoplatonic Augustinian philosophical foundation. So overall, I would say that my intellectual, spiritual roots and influences are Aeschylus, Socrates, Plato, Plotinus, Augustine, Dun Scotus and his co-worker Gerard Hopkins, Emily Dickinson, Charlotte Bronte, Virginia Woolf, Simone Weil, Sigmund Freud and post-Freudian object relations and relational analysts, C.G. Jung and James Hillman, Rene Girard, Flannery O'Connor, phenomenologists such as Husserl and Merleau-Ponty, and also St. Pope John Paul II, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, Pope Francis, Joseph Pieper, as well as Saints Teresa, Therese, Faustina, and Padre Pio. I found over the years, since I've been teaching human formation at Holy Apostles since 2010, that such a perspective is helpful for seminarians to know themselves, to self-examine, and change habits that are interfering with their formation. Though I do not teach my books and what I'm discussing today directly, I do see the course material that I do teach through a depth psychological lens. And this approach has helped the students accept their vulnerability, even their brokenness, through looking at repetitive patterns in their life that have been obstacles to their connection to God, yet also teaching tools to get closer to God. And it has been a help to seminarians, as they have told me, even after ordination, when they were in the field or parish. Therefore, I heartily agree with Monsignor McCarthy's view in this class last semester, and I believe again in a posted video this week, that imagination and feeling have to be integrated more into seminary formation. So let's look now at this realm of depth psychology specifically. We know what matter is, right? I'm hitting the desk. And when you said the rosary or pray to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit this morning, you know what spirit is. But is there a realm between those two realms? This is the domain of depth psychology. Here's the realm of the creative imagination. So if I say universally known figures such as the Narnia children, Jane Eyre, Hamlet, Beatrice, many people can see and even feel a familiarity with that figure. But it is not spirit, and it is not matter. St. Teresa saw a beautiful crystal globe in the shape of a castle with seven mansions, an interior castle which furthered her work in her Christian vocation, yet she did not pray to it, and no one else saw it. It was not spirit or matter. When we have a dream, we see the figures and landscapes in the dream as if they're real. And when we awake, they still seem real. And we realize that they affect us, they have an impact on us during the day, yet they are not spirit or matter. You're angry with a colleague because he or she is intrusive and talks about you behind your back continually and you resent and fume about it and try not to retaliate, but you find it takes a toll on you. Then you look beneath, behind the surface, and see that your early years with your older sibling and or a parent are exactly the pattern from which the current relationship with your colleague participates. This pattern, which often repeats in the personal life, is not spirit or matter. So let's go further into this realm in between spirit and matter, this intermediate realm of depth psychology. 
it does include characters in literature in the canon. In their speaking of the process of creative writing, authors state that there is a continuum from the omniscient narrator giving the character its thoughts, feeling, actions, to the other process of the author receiving the thoughts, actions, and feelings of the character in a way that actually surprises the author. Now, all statements by the following authors are discussed in a text written by Mary Watkins, Invisible Guests, The Development of Imaginal Dialogues, The Analytic Press. And I'm quoting page 92, 93, 94, and 98. Henry James said that his characters were, quote, well in advance of him, and he had to catch up with them, breathless and a little flurried as best he could. Elizabeth Bowen said, quote, the term creation of character is misleading. Characters pre-exist. They are found. Proust's response to a woman who criticized him for making his character Swan ridiculous was that he, quote, had no wish to make Swan ridiculous, far from it. But when he had come to this part of the work, he had found it unavoidable. In his jealousy, Swan acted in the ridiculous way he did, in spite of Proust's intention as an author. Ivan, in The Brothers Karamazov, has arguments that Dostoevsky stated, quote, arise independently of his own desires. Flannery O'Connor stated that she didn't know what a character was going to do, quote, until 10 or 12 lines before he did it. But when I found out that this was what was going to happen, I realized it was inevitable. O'Connor says that nothing can be predicted about these mysterious moments in a story where they represent the working of grace for the characters. That, that was her, those were her words, working of grace for the characters. So Flannery O'Connor calls it the working of grace when God sends figures to lead her in her Christian vocation. And we'll see another example, clear example of this with St. Augustine in a short while. So the writer of great literature does not make but finds the forms, as do all true artists, conjoining the eternal with the sensible world. God works through them to lead us to truth in the depths. And here is why classic literature and enduring art speak across generations. Now, I am not claiming that these figures and landscapes are subsistent universals apart from human experience in a world of their own. They are imminent, and it is, of course, a question whether they are independent of particulars, that is, unchanged, ontologically real and subsistent. However, they are not purely subjective either. That is, not only they are because of human existence and agency. So following the Neoplatonic Augustinian tradition, we can understand that there are forms connecting both the body of Christ and the tangible world. Such forms encompass what has been called an intermediate or middle realm. And following diatema, in Plato's Symposium, and some of Simone Weil's work, we see that some have called this realm metoxy, which is a Greek preposition meaning between. In Plato's Symposium, and I'm using Rus's translation, Socrates relays the discussion about love that he had with his tutor, Diotima of Mantinea, quote, who was wise in this matter and in many others. 200c. She had shown him that even he did not think that love was either a god or human. Then what is it, he asks. She replies that it is between, that is metoxy, the divine and mortal, a diamond, D-A-I-M-O-N, daimones would be plural, plural. He asks, well, what power does the diamond love have? She replies, quote, to interpret and to ferry across to the gods things given by men, and to men things from gods, from men petitions and sacrifices, from the gods commands and requitals in return, and being in the middle, it completes them and binds all together into a whole, 202c. 
So the metoxy is between God and human in the sense of a communication between the infinite and the finite. Now, I don't see it, as does Plato and Vogelin, as a step-by-step ascent to virtues, though I agree with Vogelin that it is where the divine and human mutually participate. And I agree with Rhodes on page 16 of his article, What is Metoxy, Diatema and Vogelin, in where he says that, quote, meditation on the problem of metoxy can propel us toward the real virtues and the perfect revelations. So I see it as a form of communication. In fact, I say circuit from some of what Plato understood as forms to the sensible world and back, but a modern version of forms. That, <clears throat> that is, for Plato and some Neoplatonists, daimones and metoxy are a root to Platonic forms, which are objective subsistent essences, which result in the existence of particular objects, sensible particulars in the world. Such forms, such as, of course, beauty, truth, the good, are the most real on the ontological level, always true, despite factors of time and space. Now, it is controversial how the forms reside in the spiritual realm, outside the rational. Frederick Copleston, in his History of Philosophy, Volume 1, Part 1, quotes Taylor, stating that Socrates' speech in Symposium on the ascent in degrees to the form of beauty is analogous to the spiritual voyage of St. John of the Cross in Dark Night of the Soul, as well as Bonaventure in Journey of the Mind to God. He acknowledges that other scholars disagree with such, yet Copleston holds out for the possibility of it. This is page 223 and 226. We also have Socrates speaking on diamond in Plato's Apology. It's a sign he says he had since a child, a voice which forbids him to do something he is thinking of doing, but it never suggests or commands anything, which is why he says he never became a politician and instead a philosopher. It told him not to become a politician. You can see Apology 32a. This voice was a divine command, 38d, which opposes him if he is going to do evil and not good, 41a. So my sense is that imaginal figures and landscapes have some autonomy and lead to forms, but that is very different than Plato's lowest state of cognition in his divided line, Icasia, imaginings or illusions, mere reflections, shadows of reality. Instead, my sense is closer to Plato's understanding of image through his use of dramatic dialogues themselves in order to turn the soul to reality. Now, as you probably know, Plato's criticized for not specifying more about the separation of forms and material particularities. The modern Christian Platonist philosopher, Simone Weil, W-E-I-L, who lived in the first half of the 20th century, sees it as a bridge. Now, as an overview, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy states that her sense of intermediaries, she says metaxu, the plural, is how God is available to the world. That is, what we experience as painful distance from God is also an intermediate connection to God. And in her later work, Metaxu is reality itself. The real is an impediment or obstacle physically, interpersonally, or in the mind when we come into contact with necessity and we must move through the contradiction into spiritual advancement through a mysterious or even, she says, crucifying process. So now going to her essay on Metaxu itself. This is in the Simone Bay reader, editor, George Panakis. I'm quoting pages 363 and 365. She famously describes this, quote, two prisoners whose cells adjoin communicate with each other by knocking on the wall. The wall is the thing which separates them, but it is also their means of communication. It is the same with us and God. Every separation is a link. She states that it is a sacrilege to destroy the metoxu the region of good and evil, for to destroy the base doesn't matter. 
and to destroy the high is impossible since it can't be touched by us. She states, quote, no human being should be deprived of his metaxu, that is to say of those relative and mixed blessings, home, country, traditions, culture, etc., which warm and nourish the soul, and without which, short of sainthood, a human life is not possible. She continues, the true earthly blessings are metaxu. We can respect those of others insofar as we regard those we ourselves possess, possess as metaxu. This implies that we are already making our way toward the point where it is possible to do without them. For example, if we are to respect foreign countries, we make of our own country not an idol, but a stepping stone to God. And again, on Matoxu, she says, quote, the temporal having no meaning except by and for the spiritual, but not being mixed with the spiritual. In my view, the Matoxi doesn't impoverish the material sensate realm any more than it does the divine realm. So my work does not hold the Neoplatonic denigration of matter, but in a phenomenological manner, sees the divine working in and through matter, circulating. So actually, to say this is an intermediate or middle realm is a misnomer. These figures are not between, yet move in a circuit communicating the divine to human and back without negating their difference. So I depart from the platonic sense of emanation. Also, I see metoxy as fluid, as a circuit between God and human, infinite and finite, and based in faith and Christianity, which means that good and evil exist, as do sin, atonement, and redemption, and are not to be psychologized away. As I said, I discuss all this in my book, Orbits of Symphony. Well, Aristotle's respect for the sensate experience and the concrete is very helpful, and only an approach incorporating the Platonic as well as some of the Aristotelian method can proceed to reality. I'm thinking here, of course, of Raphael's great fresco, The School of Athens, where Plato and Aristotle are communicating while walking together, pointing in different directions, one up and the other out. The Aristotelian methodology of precise observation and specificity of measurement is applied to my study of metoxia circuit. That is, the images and figures there must be approached each in the specificity of shape, voice, and intention. Now, yet again, these figures are not between really, yet move in a circuit as communication with and leading the sensate to the forms without negating their difference. The question in my work pertains to the reality of these figures and their relation to forms as divine, as well as to the human and natural world. For example, there is St. Augustine in the garden who experienced and wrote about the crucial importance of one of these figures in his conversion. And I'm using here the translation of Augustine's Confessions by John K. Ryan. So crucial to Augustine's conversion was the female figure of continence. Now, continence here means self-restraint, self-control, especially in regard to sex, with which he had a problem. When he was in turmoil in the garden, conflicted between many contrary natures and wills, his old lovers and vanities of vanities, he calls them, were holding him back. They were actually pulling him. We would say in, in his mind or in, let, let's say, let's just say behind, he saw them behind him, but they weren't there literally. We would say that he was beginning to connect to the Trinity and was lured, pulled from behind even to stay unconnected. He says, quote, yet they did delay me, for I hesitated to tear myself away and shake myself free of them and leap over to that place where I was called to be. Book 8, Chapter 11, Paragraph 26. Yet an overpowering habit, he says, question if he could live without these lovers. But as this habit's voice got weaker, a figure appeared to him. So figures in the metoxy appear, so habits can weaken. So we know that Augustine previously had heard the Trinity speak through two events. God uses people and their narratives to open the circuit to Christ's body. In Book 8, Chapter 2, Augustine told Simplicianus 
the spiritual father of St. Ambrose, that he had read Platonist books translated by Victorinus, who, after teaching rhetoric at Rome, had died a Christian. Simplicianus congratulated Augustine for not falling for other philosophies since he said the word of God was in the works of the, of the Platonists. And then he told him the story of the conversion of Victorinus. So he tells Augustine that he had known Victorinus. The latter had worshipped idols and participated in sacrilegious rites, but in old age had come to Christ and the church. Now, Victorinus' particular conversion and how it involved the cognitive transition from the pagan philosophies became part of how Augustine thought, how he experienced affect, how his will became oriented to become Christian. God spoke to Augustine about a philosophical transition through Neoplatonism to Christianity, through the figure of Victorinus, now a member of Augustine's family. The other event was an account by Patricianus, who in Book 8, Chapter 6, introduced Augustine to the life of St. Anthony by recounting how two of his friends, who when they read St. Anthony's life, were converted and dedicated their lives to God. St. Anthony's thoughts, affects, will, and conversion became open to these friends of Pontisianus. And through hearing of this story, the figure of St. Anthony spoke to Augustine and influenced him. Now, I use the word affect, A-F-F-E-C-T, since it, is, it means the intensity in the body from stimuli leading to feelings personally conveyed and emotions socially conveyed. Upon hearing these accounts, Book A, Chapter 7, Paragraph 16, Augustine says to the Lord, quote, You took me from behind my own back where I had placed myself because I did not wish to look at myself. You stood me face to face with myself so that I might see how foul I was, how deformed and defiled, how covered with stains and sores. I looked and I was filled with horror, but there was no place for me to flee away from myself. So Augustine moved from behind his own back where he had put himself because he didn't want to look at himself. That is, he admits he had been staying where he wasn't aware of himself. To be open to the circuit participating in Christ's body is to move from being behind one's own back to look at oneself. Now, there have been many versions of what constitutes examining that of what one is unaware, yet in the 21st century, we cannot proceed in such without including the methods of studying the unconscious, since that indeed is where we are behind ourselves, are unaware of ourselves. When we are behind ourselves, we are unconscious. We are caught in thoughts, feelings, actions, reactions of which we are not aware. When we move out of being unconscious of where we have put ourselves, we can be guided by a figure in the depth psychological realms, moving us to virtue, a circuit to virtue. When Augustine faces himself, there's a raging common combat, he says, within himself. Book 8, chapter 7 through 8. He goes to the garden famously, where he experiences a most turbulent anger and undergoes bodily movements, movements of his limbs, tearing his hair, and he's in ter turmoil. In book 8, chapter 10, he says, quote, Therefore, I was at war within myself, and I was laid waste by myself, a single soul wavering between different wills. In chapter 11, he continues, quote, within the hidden depths of my soul, O Lord, you urged me on. And as an aside, note that God is in his soul's depths here, which is Christian depth psychology. Then Augustine is besieged by his old lovers suggesting filthy things and by the habit saying he can't live without them. A figure that only he can see then appears to him on the outside. She is, quote, the chaste dignity of continence, serene and joyous, but in no wanton fashion, virtuously alluring, so that I would come to her and hesitate no longer. Book A, chapter 11, paragraph 27. This woman, alluring him to virtue, held in her hands those who the Lord God had given to her, boys, girls, men, and women of all ages. She tells him to cast himself on God, and he would heal him. 
because she tells him to stand on himself is not to stand at all. She says, quote, turn deaf ears to those unclean members of yours upon the earth so that they may be mortified. They tell you of delights, but not as does the law of your Lord, your God. Book eight, chapter 11, paragraph 27. So when we are behind our own back, because we do not want to look at ourselves unconscious, we can be listening to our unhealthy, destructive members. And to not be participating in the body of Christ is to attempt to keep these members alive, to keep in their orbit, instead of letting them be, as she said, mortified. Becoming one with, identifying with these unhealthy members occurs because they're part of the wounds of a parent often or a parent's ancestry that are speaking, asking for attention. So to go under them, act them out, paradoxically occurs through an act of love. The child unconsciously takes on the wounded, defiled, deformed members to rid the family of them and protect the loved ones. And here you can see my book since 1983, where I go into and elaborate on that phenomenon. So once he hears the lady of continence, Augustine then goes into another mighty storm of emotion, deeply weeping. And that's when he hears the child's voice, take up and read, take up and read. Book eight, chapter 12, paragraphs 28 through 29. At that moment, he remembers St. Anthony. I think Anthony appears as a figure to him. And he remembers that St. Anthony had been directed by hearing the gospel that was being read at the time. And so Augustine opens the Bible. And as you know, St. Paul's book of Romans 13, 13 to 14 speaks of his life, exhorts him no longer to live in drunkenness and impurity and leads to his conversion. Now, an important part here is that all of Augustine's conversion is done within the deep relationship with his friend Olypius, who accompanies him throughout and is also converted by the verse following the verse that spoke to Augustine. For us to be pulled to such unhealthy members and undergo the repeated pathology of the family and then see through that, get the distance to see the pathological pattern and engage it effectively, is to inquire the meaning, logos, within the affect associated with the figures pulling us. This is an arduous task. The pull under by such members is exceedingly strong as Augustine experienced. The interaction with them and deliverance from them cannot be done without faith and the intercession of others. Look what he had. Figures of St. Anthony, St. Paul, Victorinus, the Lady of Continence, as well as human relationship. His mother, St. Ambrose, Simplicianus, Pontisianus, and yeah, his friend Lippius, who was there with him the entire time, including when he was in the garden. Note that the Lady of Continence is not distinct from Augustine's affect, the mighty storm. She's part of that. She's the figure moving within these affects and passing through them as she communicates to him. She moves him through his affects to the form of continence, which is a virtue. <clears throat> now, he had access to her communication only when contained in the relationship with Olypius, held within the garden, and have had listened previously to accounts by faith, he ceased acting out these emotional storms and instead let them move through him to find the image at the core of them, the Lady of Continents. So we can say that when Augustine, in a secure place, witnessed his affect instead of being possessed by it, it became the force allowing its hidden meaning to manifest. And here was the communication of the Lady of Continents, where the grace of faith, turn deaf ears, take up and read, led to opening the Bible, allowing the space to witness affect and understand logos, its inherent articulate communication. Here is a moment when the divine spoke through figures of the Metoxy who exerted a physical force upon the man, generating affect and the choice of how to relate to such, leading to the virtue of continence. Now, it's interesting that one translation of the Confessions, this is Henry Chadwick, Oxford University, in the hands of Lady Continence, when she was holding the people of, who, of all ages, Augustine says in this translation, quote, in every one of them was continence herself, in no sense barren, but the fruitful mother of children, the joys born of you, 
Lord, her husband. And then a few sentences down, she says, their Lord God gave me to them. That is, the form is virtue continence, eternal and unchanging, became a figure in the metoxy through which the virtue was given to humans through the gift of God. And this is what I mean by circuit. And when the lady of continence told him that the lovers of vanities could then be, quote unquote, mortified, she did not mean that they would die literally. She meant that the vice holding his family line repetitively from the narrow circuit, and he describes it as a chain, could be broken so the future ones could better attain participation in body. Authentic vocation. Indeed, for centuries, St. Augustine's larger family has inherited this participation in Christ's body. Mortified here means that the members are no longer possessing one and one's not going over them by being totally identified with them. But in my view, they need to be commemorated in order not to go recede back to the unconscious, only to erupt later. This means that parts of them that were of goodness in relation are symbolized and carried out in one's life. And I think it could be said that the way St. Augustine was not as derogatory or denigrating of the material sensate world as had been his Neoplatonic uh, predecessors could be where his old lovers were well commemorated. So another example from St. John Henry Newman, who states, gazing on the brazen serpent did not heal, but God's invisible communication of the gift of health to those who gazed. So also justification is wholly the work of God. It comes from God to us. It is a power exerted on our souls by him as the healing of the Israelites was a power exerted on their bodies. This is from a Newman synthesis in his lecture, The Characteristics of the Gift of Righteousness, section six. So the brazen serpent, as you know, seen in Numbers 21, verses six through nine, and discussed again in John three, verses 14 to 21, is a figure in the metoxy, which is why St. John Henry Newman capitalized it. It's a symbol that can be understood beyond its literal expression. It points to a later cross. God works through the figures of the metoxy that work outside of chronological time. Through the concrete brazen serpent was the invisible communication of God, which was also a power exerted on the Israelites' physical bodies. Therefore, the metoxy is not between the earth, daily life, physical reality, and sacred highest good. Yet is where the latter is in the former and is where God's grace draws each to one another, leading to communication and healing. So in this last section, I'm glad to say that there have been quite reputable Catholics who have relevance for depth psychology. First, St. Pope John Paul II in his encyclical Fides et Ratio, page 64. Yet closer scrutiny shows that even in philosophical thinking of those who helped drive faith and reason further apart, there are found at times precious and seminal insights, which if pursued and developed with mind and heart rightly tuned, can lead to the discovery of truth's way. Such insights are found, for instance, in the penetrating analyses of perception and experience of the imaginary and the unconscious of personhood and intersubjectivity of freedom and values of time and history. Second, James Shaw in his book, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI's The Regensburg Lecture has another important comment for depth psychology. And I'm not talking about the controversial part of that lecture. I think it probably would have been better if the Pope had addressed more of the violence done by Christians in the past or how medieval Christian Europe only received Greek philosophy, the insights of Greek philosophy through Muslim carriers. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the other part. Rishal states on page 104, quote, Benedict observes that modern science presupposes the mathematical structure of nature. This structure implies an intrinsic rationality within nature, something not put there by the human mind as such. Benedict, following many things in his works, calls this background the platonic element of the modern understanding of nature. 
Plato, as we recall, was fascinated by mathematics, Schroll continues. We should note that what is operative here is something more than the subjective imposition of mathematics by the human will on nature. The structure is found to be already there. Our minds knowing themselves recognize it and can use it. You can also see page 117 on that. We can say that the metoxy is the way God helps us recognize the structure that is within nature and can lead to participation in Christ's body. This is, I'm talking now. Affect is the energy containing the information that leads us to it. And in faith, allows us to find intrinsic rationality. Now, this intrinsic rationality within nature, discussed by Shaul, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, in my view, also includes family or tribulations, very difficult patterns of suffering, pathological suffering, passed down generationally. There's a certain logic in these patterns being transmitted. Here is the logic within forms in the divine mind. And as an aside, I agree with Augustine, of course, that the forms are in the word, Christ consubstantial with the Father, and they are not like the Neoplatonic uh, predecessors. They're not noose. They're not a subordinate hypostasis. Finally, and lastly, another reputable Catholic discussing the necessity of depth psychology. Joseph Pieper discusses cathartic mania in Plato's Phaedrus. In his book, Divine Madness, Plato's Case Against Secular Humanism by Ignatius. On pages 23 through 25, he discusses tribulations passed down in families and says that humans can be delivered from them only through, quote unquote, the process of healing, relinquishing, quote, rational self-control and submit to being led and affected, for instance, by delving into the domain of the unconscious and of dreams. In fact, he notes that attempts to free oneself by rational methods only make the burdens more burdensome. In closing, we are asked not to identify with these passed down patterns, not repress them, but to get the message from God, what they, how they're part of our being and vocation, and propelled and held by faith, stay with the affects, and become aware of the meanings in them and be guarded, guided. Now, I found that this inherent structure is a language, a language of the unconscious, a lyrical analytic language, which is a non-discursive language, but containing inherent meaning, which I have been finding and writing from for about 40 years. And I hope that I'm part of changing the fact that the main contributions in the field depth psychology are from a male perspective and not Christian. That is why in the 1980s, I worked on the figures of the metoxy from a classic novel by a woman, Charlotte Bronte, in that work, Lyrical Analysis, The Unconscious Through Jane Eyre. On page 19, I discuss the literary figures in the canon as metaphysical. Quote, how can it be understood that Bronte's figures have implications for an unconscious, which was not even found or named during the time she wrote, end quote. From analysis of the figures and landscapes of her novel, alongside working with patients, I have found a threefold etiology of particular addictions and psychopathologies relevant for today. Then my findings there and their interaction with my analytic practice led to the integration of depth psychological realms with Christianity, which I discussed in my book, The Articulate Silence of God, published 2002, as well as Orbits of Symphony, 2015. And in between those years and continuing now from them, I've written other books in a lyric, lyrical analytic language. So there's an invisible communication of God through the metaxy. Lady Continent spoke to St. Augustine. Likewise, St. Teresa, St. Faustina, Padre Pio, and many other saints had dialogues with figures leading to and from God through metaxy as circuit. The circuit has levels. There are angels and they have a hierarchy. There are those who are human and now intimate with God, the saints. There are figures representing virtues. There are figures representing vices. The trajectory of my work has been to explore the metoxia circuit and its relation to personality, interpersonal relationship, pathology, and how it all has its source in God. Thank you, and I'm going to show you now the bibliography. Okay. Hold on. 
Can you see it? No? Uh, I see a white screen. Oh, okay. Let me get back. Hold on. But you are sharing something. Okay, let me stop share and do it again. I have it on multiple. Oh, you know what it might be? I got it because I, even though I'm co-host, and I have mine set up for me to go directly to my desk, maybe because you're co-host, you don't. But can you see it now? Yes, I can okay. see it. Okay. If you would uh, send me a copy of this bibliography, I'll put it in the show notes. Sure. And this is it. I mean, it's basically, you know, one page, but. Okay. Let's go stop share. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Arden. Uh, does anybody have a question? I have one, but I'll, uh, I'll defer to our guests first. All right. Uh, Alan, Dr. Vincelet, go ahead. I'm a philosopher, so I was impressed with your knowledge of philosophy, although I'm going to ask a psychological question. So does depth psychology, does that come out of uh, Jung? Is that oh, actually, it started with Freud. And Freud. Uh, he explored his own unconscious when his father died and wrote The Interpretation of Dreams, although he had worked previously with Breuer with the hysterical um, uh, symptoms in Vienna. But it was really, yeah. Okay. And that kind of, you I kind of leaves my question kind of hinted at it. So to what extent then can dreams be kind of a metoxy or a source of the divine coming into us? Definitely. That's yeah. To, I mean, that's how I got to it. I mean, yeah, there, there, I think God works through figures of the dream for sure. Not all. And one has to discern like in the Bible, but yeah, definitely. That's that's the royal road. I definitely think it is true, but not as Freud thought, not just to the personal unconscious, but to in general, to a communication with God for us to know our vocation, work with others. Yeah, very much so. Do you dream? <laughs> Everyone dreams. It's a question of writing them down. Yeah, I forget them a lot, but. Uh... Yeah, they're like, do they evaporate? Well, what a good segue into my question then. And uh, I'll pose it and we'll see uh, who else has something. Um, in, the, in the idea of the figure, in the idea of the dream, uh, you've got this wonderful uh, image of Dante Alighieri on the uh, ledge of sloth in purgatory. Right. And he falls asleep and he dreams of a siren. So okay. she's an old lady. She is um, a hideous. But the more he looks at her, the more she turns beautiful. I love and the it. turns into an object of desire, but more than that, an object of lust. So is she a vice? She is a vice, yeah. Uh, she represents uh, the vices in the ledges above, uh, the ledge of sloth. Yeah, sure. And uh, Good and evil are in there. Right, exactly. So uh, here you've got the grotesque, the figure that shows up to entice mm -hmm. and to lure somebody away right. from the virtue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, Flannery O'Connor uses that a lot in her stories, as you probably know, you know, the grotesque figure, and it can either turn one to God, like the freak and the temple of the Holy Ghost, or refuse grace and stay aligned with evil, as in a good man is hard to find. And also, um, remember, I mean, I, you, you know this better than anyone here, but in the Inferno, um, the, the truth of Dante hears the truth of God through Virgil's hearing of Beatrice, right? And Beatrice tells Virgil from paradise, she heard Dante went astray and she asks him to go. She asks if she can go to Dante's aid and introduces herself as Beatrice, but she had once been living yet to Dante once dead, she became a God bearing what image of glory, a communication of grace. So she became a figure of the metoxy though she had once been living. And don't forget, it was love that moved her to speak. And she was moved by the compassion of Mary and I think Lucy. So, you know, this is, again, the incredible interposition of human, human life with all this. That's why we can't just talk about these figures as 
transcendent in the sense of not not involved with the human. And Augustine had to hear the stories of Victorinus and, and Pontisianus's friends. All that was part of his conversion and his ability to see the Lady of Continents. So thank you for bringing up. Yeah, thank you for bringing up. Um, I think Claire had something. Uh, she had unmuted herself for a moment. Yeah, I just had a quick question to follow what Alan was asking about dream life. You know, um, you said we all dream, but we don't necessarily remember it, which is very true. What would be a technique for us to try to cultivate our ability to remember our dream life? Thank you for asking that, actually, because a number of patients would come in and say they would never dream, you know, all this. And you put a little piece of paper by the side of your bed. And even if you get just one word like blue, when you wake up, you write it down. The next night you might get two words or you just might get a glimmer. You keep writing it down. And sure enough, you'll end up with a dream. I mean, I had, you know, I was working in New Haven. So I had some highly intelligent professionals sometimes working with them and they would be against, you know, all that. But then they started and the dreams had such an inner logic and intelligence that they would then come in with pages of typewritten dreams. But yeah, that, that's, really? the, yeah, that is the way. It's probably a slow process, but I think, you know, your advice to start with even one word and then develop an understanding of, you know, the deeper part of us, uh, it's, a, it's a very good approach. Thank you. Even if you sit with it and part of your self-examination during the day or prayer life and you just sit with some of the figures in the dream and ask God, why, you know, why that one? What am I supposed to see? You know, what virtue or vice are you either calling me to or from? Thank you for that. Thank you. Jane? You mentioned using this with seminarians, and I'm curious if our Western seminarians respond differently to this than our Eastern seminarians. Is it, how much of this is cultural or is it beyond culture? It's a good question, James. I really believe it is beyond culture. Uh, first of all, again, I, I don't teach what I've taught here and this kind of, you know, going into, you know, depth psychology per se. I teach very, um, you know, you know, traditional uh, subjects like Catholic approach to depression and homosexuality and, you know, just basic topics that, you know, the, the seminaries and the seminaries and the church are dealing with um, attachment theory. And, but as I see, see through these different areas, it ultimately comes down to their own patterns. And this is what, when I started the talk, I talked about patterns. I actually ended the talk with that too. Patterns that are familiarly intergenerationally passed down. There are psychological approaches these days that are accepting this more and more, of course, but not often in terms of figures that are beyond the personal, you know, that are from God. And so I find very little difference between the Eastern and Western students. But in fact, the Eastern students seem to have a little more suffering in their life and in some ways better uh, sense of this intergenerational transition, unfortunately, because there's been such poverty and, um, and they admitted alcoholism and, you know, domestic violence and whatnot. And so to help them get to some of these patterns and how they've impacted their own spiritual life and their relation with God, you know, has been helpful. And, uh, so I haven't noticed a difference, and, you know, I think the main thing is for them to feel comfortable in the class so they can look at this, some of these patterns without shame. That's the most important thing because otherwise when they become a priest and a par parishioner might touch on the, some of them or get under their skin relating to some of these patterns, we wouldn't want the unworked issues to erupt in any way. So. Thank you for the question. Uh, Gwen has a question. Uh, she asked if I could repeat it. Sure. Uh, uh, she's quoting, artists and writers do not make their art, but rather, and she has question marks. And then she asked, has your research in this area included other forms of art from literature? 
Oh, like the visual arts, right? I think she means like visual art. Well, let's go with visual arts, sure. I'm not sure. Oh, drama too, probably. Yeah. Um, well, it sort of depends. Well, no, outside of literature. So drama would be part of that. I think she might mean painting. Oh, visual. Auditory. Visual art for you. Okay. Yeah, no, I haven't, Gwen. That's up to you to do. I think that would be a great project for you. Why don't you, because um, I know you're talented in those areas. Um, why don't you do that? I mean, I actually, I do oil paint, but it's mainly just to keep my imagination alive. And it's, you know, nothing, it's a hobby, but, but no, that would be a great project for you. You said um, this is beyond culture. Uh, is culture itself a met, um, metoxy? Yeah, they would say so. Simone Vey would say so. Yes. Um, and yet, it sort of depends on how we defined it, of course. But did you have something in mind, a part of culture or? No, just uh, uh, I haven't mined down into the idea. It just came to me when you were speaking earlier. So. Yeah, I mean, of course, it's somewhere because it's all connected with the personal, the person's life. Like Augustine had to hear the stories of Simplicianus. That was in his culture and Pontisianus and St. Ambrose. And, you know, it's all interwoven with one's personal life. So culture is a part of it, of course, yes. But I, I wouldn't say that there's no metoxy in certain cultures or anything like that, you know, or there's no inter intermediate, uh, these kinds of um, intervening fi figures with communication from God. I think every culture has its own figures, but of course they're going to look very different from culture to culture. Sure. And we see figures like that in the, the Vietnamese Mary, for instance, the, the Madonna, you know, or the, uh, the way in which Africans would depict that and, and so on. Yes. Um, so it has implications, perhaps, for the field of intercultural studies or intercultural competencies, even, you know, yeah. how to engage others uh, with the realization that we're, we're talking barriers, but barriers that are ways in which we connect, that mm -hmm. allow us to connect with, like the wall that separates two, uh, two mm -hmm. groups or two people. Yeah, I mean, even to explore that, how are Mary and Christ seen in other cultures? Uh, you know, I mean, remember Faustina was so upset because she could never get the painter, although he tried so hard and she appreciated it to really get the image, you know, that she saw of Christ. Um, you know, but how are in different cultures, how are how are how are Mary and, and Christ seen and experienced and uh, engaged with? Yeah, that would be a fascinating way to join forces and and, uh, you know, communicate between culture sure um the uh, the concept that you provided then seems that it would be something that would be very useful uh to all disciplines mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh we've gone through uh, uh several just in the past few moments here mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of uh, applying it to mm -hmm. better understand the disciplines that we're in and then their relationship perhaps to others yeah that's a good point I, i'd love for that to happen yeah that's a great point in the future, hopefully. We're at the end of our time. Do you have uh, any summative remarks uh, before we ask um, uh, Claire to close us in prayer? No, I just wanted to thank everyone. I've been, you know, shy to share my work for so long. So this has been a real privilege. So thank you. It's been a real privilege having you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arden. Mm -hmm. uh, Claire, if you would. Thank you. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, we thank Dr. Arden for her insightful presentation on a very complex field of deaf psychology. Uh, may any insights that we have gained today through the lecture allow us to understand this invisible communication we do have with God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Claire. Amen. Well, thank, thank you. Everybody. For and thank you, Dr. Arden, and we'll see everybody again uh, uh, for the next time we do this, which I believe is Monday with Dr. Joseph White. Okay, thank you. So God, God bless you and be safe. Thank you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together 
to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabel Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.